as other speakers have said, it's a real pleasure. And I have to come down here because I can't really see the screen from up there, so I don't know what I'm talking about. It's a real pleasure um, to talk today and congratulate Jim to the Dreyfus Award. It, it's very much, um, um, it's well-deserved for many reasons, including the textbook that Jim wrote. So he reaches a huge amount of undergraduates. The research his group has done and also the research people coming out of his group has done is really um, impressive. I will be talking about a um, topic that's quite controversial. It's um, climate intervention via stratospheric aeros aerosol injection. And I'll talk about whether one can reduce risk of that using different materials than the ones that exist naturally. And in, in some sense, I wonder what Paul, the previous speaker, would think about what I'm talking about. Um, what I'm showing here is sort of a, a sketch that's supposed to highlight the fundamental idea of what I'll be talking about. If we have business as usual, what's going to happen is that it's going to get much warmer down here. We're going to have climate change. This is supposed to be a skier. I have to admit, I first made this figure for a, a talk I gave in Davos in Switzerland, so it was uh, more appropriate than here, perhaps. Temperatures go up. Actually, stratospheric temperatures go down, which actually means ozone will pro probably go up due to the decreasing stratospheric temperatures from increased CO2. If we uh, add sulfate aerosols to the stratosphere, volcanic eruptions have shown this, I'll show this as well. What's going to happen is because that scatters back sunlight, that actually decreases the temperature back down here and you may have be able to ski again. This is, a, this is my artistic rendition of a skier having a sunburn because the stratosphere gets higher and because of these surfaces, you actually start destroying ozone. And so there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's some risks associated with it, ozone destruction and higher temperatures in the stratosphere. And one of the questions as a material scientist, as a materials chemist, you can ask yourself, well, out of the millions of compounds you can imagine, there's got to be some compounds that have lower risk than the sulfate that exists naturally from volcanoes. So can you find new materials that do not destroy ozone, that, um, but however, allow you to cool the temperature down here as well? This is work that um, is funded by Harvard and also ETH Zurich. There's some collaborators whose work I will show that who are working with at Harvard right now that are working with me. Some of these results are quite new that I'll talk about. And there's a bunch of other people that have worked, contributed to this, and I'll try to mention them at the appropriate places. So again, the idea is of this idea, it is a very controversial and in many sense sounds like an entirely crazy idea, is, well, you know, Greenhouse gases trap heat down here, they warm the planet. You can add particles in the stratosphere, and with that, sunlight gets reflected, sunlight, less sunlight hits the ground, it's going to get cooler. It's pretty obvious that that principle works. The thing that, the reason I, I think one has to investigate this and do research on this is that this actually can be done quite quickly if we wanted. People have shown if you wanted to start this, you could probably start, within five years, you could start doing this. It's technologically feasible. It's actually cheap. If you look at just the cost of doing, not, not the things that could go wrong that are much more expensive, not the monitoring equipment need to you look at this, but if people are in, in, feel pressure and say, we have to do something right now, it can be cheaply. Actually, I would make the argument a little bit uh, flippantly that for less than the price of chewing gum, you can cool down the planet one degree Celsius. And that is a true statement. It's imperfect. This is not the reverse of greenhouse gases. These act in infrared. This acts in the solar UV visible. Different virulent. It's not the opposite of the actual thing causing climate change. Um, high uncertainty associated with this. That's why I think uh, the research is important. And one of the fundamental things is this fundamentally does not address the cause of climate change. It doesn't address what we heard about this morning, ocean acidification. If you keep emitting CO2, oceans will keep getting more acidic. So no actual addressing the cause. I always compare this with a painkiller. So the idea, one of the ideas is that if the humanity is too slow to really address climate change, this could act to potentially address overshoots while you're trying to get uh, the system under control again. And so it's like a painkiller. This means if, if there's something wrong with you, you need to have surgery, you can take a painkiller to lessen the pain. Right? So it doesn't address the cause. The painkiller will not actually help you fix why you need surgery. And there's a lot of problems that arise from that because if you take the painkiller, you may say, oh, I'm really busy and I have this thing next week or next month, so I'll just keep taking painkillers instead of actually having the surgery you should be doing. And this is what's called the moral hazard 
problem of, of climate intervention. But let's go on. Um, why even talk about this? So what I sh show here is this uh, IPCC one and a half degrees report. That's a little uh, older now, but it has statements. The statements you heard out of this in Paris are well, we need to have CO2 emissions by 2030, and BC you need to neutral by 2050. That's the kind of arguments you heard. Yeah, I want to make clear about this thing that this doesn't say no CO2 emissions, right? It says CO2 neutral, and this will become important in a second. The challenge of the one and a half and two degrees Celsius, this is from a previous IPCC report, a new version, it's similar, it's not quite the same, but the rough idea is that in that one, if you wanted to stay below one and a half degrees Celsius, there was a two thirds chance, chance if you could limit global emissions since 1870 to 2,250 gigatons of CO2. That means since 2011, when this report came out, there were 400 gigatons of CO2 roughly left to emit to hit this threshold of one and a half degrees. And I will say that a two thirds chance, meaning two thirds of the model get this, is a pretty high probability of failure if you think this is something that actually matters. In your normal life, you would never accept, accept one thirds chance of failure for something that really matters. Roughly emissions of uh, 40 gigatons CO2 equivalent per year. Again, last year, that's what the estimates are from the International Energy Association. If you do the math, 400 divided by 40, that's 10 years. This actually implies that this year, according to that IPCC, it's shifted a little bit since then. Actually, one and a half degrees is over. You cannot achieve it by emission reductions. It's just not even talk about it anymore. Then how come you get this year, right, these statements, that's because in the integrated assessment models that, the, that are used, um, which you see four scenarios for here, there is bioenergy carbon capture and storage in it, which it goes in, this, in a similar direction to what Paul was just talking about with the biofuels. You grow biomass, take CO2 out of the atmosphere into the biomass, you burn the biomass, you trap the CO2 stored underground, but you actually get some energy out of it, right? So you move CO2 from the air underground while getting energy. We don't really know how to do this. And if you look at the land area in 2050, not at the end of the century, that this will require in these models that the IPCC tells you you can achieve one and a half degrees with, if you look at any realistic models, which are only P3 and P4, because this is 2020 and we haven't seen a drop like this. If we're lucky, it's like P3. This is what we need to do. The land area used for this in 2050 is between the size of India and Australia, or 1.6 times the EU land area in these models. What is that land area? Talking about great green and sustainability, whose land is that? Does that mean the US will sacrifice one state and just say, sorry guys, that's it. We need this for growing these crops. My point is not that one shouldn't do this. I think we probably have to do things like this. But my point is that the impacts of trying to go after climate change likely are very large. This is not an easy thing we're trying to do. And that makes this climate intervention so deviously attractive. You suddenly have this cheap method. You can put things up there. You know, as I said, purposely inflammatory for less than a chewing gum, you can cool down the planet degree Celsius. That's because annual chewing gum sales are about $30 billion a year, just to give actual numbers. Um, so why would you do this, right? Why would we go with this? That's because we perhaps aren't fa fast enough. And if we look at some climate risk, fossil fuels forever, which is an idiotic scenario, let's forget about that, but, but we cut emissions to zero, the climate risk will go up and then slowly come back down again. But if there are tipping points, and we heard from Dusty that, you know, with Antarctica, all kinds of things this morning, there, there is a decent reason to think that there are tipping points. You could use, even if you do carbon removal, right? This is probably a slow process. We've integrated so much CO2 in the atmosphere. This may reach a point up here that we want to stay away from. Temperature overshoot, tipping point, whatever it may be. So there's the idea that you could use this stratospheric aerosol to sort of keep you below a tipping point or a temperature extreme while you're doing this. You can also reduce the risk of change. A lot of the risks for ecosystems has to do not with that final temperature, it actually is entirely po possible that the, the, a world one and a half degrees Celsius could be better for all of humanity, but they wouldn't be living in the same place. And if you have to do it, if it happens over you know, millennia or hundred thousands of years, you adapt, but if it happens quickly, you can't. So this rate of change is a big problem. So this is climate intervention with stratospheric sulfate aerosol. This is uh, the, this idea that has been out there. It only, I've, I've said this, addresses symptoms, not the cause. So fundamentally, it is not a solution, right? 
Um, there's a lot of risks that we don't know well, and it could be viewed as this insurance policy promoting high risk behavior. It also has a problem that you're saying, well, you know, shouldn't we spend the money on actually fixing the problem rather than trying to do research on a potential painkiller? We don't even know whether it actually can even work. Remember, if you have a real painkiller by the FDA, the reason it's a painkiller is that there's been a lot of research and there's been approval processes. This work, there's been hardly any research and we don't know approval process, global governance does not exist for this. So it's at a very early stage. And, and there's a whole bunch of other flaws, but the problem why I think one has to do research on this is that people, are not just politicians, people may view this as one of the only ways to actually try to take action fairly quickly on this problem, all right? What can it actually do? To give you an idea, here's a model that shows you a world of four times CO2 and the increase in temperature that you see globally, which essentially all of them are above the limit of the 3.2 on this scale. And here's four, point, four times CO2, where in the model the sun has been dialed down, very simple method, um, to balance out exactly the energy balance of the Earth. And what you can see is that it overcools the tropics, and it, uh, but it actually significantly decreases things. So actually, you can obviously reduce the temperature of the planet. And that makes sense, there's less sunlight coming down. If we look at it in a little bit more detail, what it can do, if you actually go to an approach where you use about 50%, that means CO2 increases the energy balance at the Earth's surface and you dial it back down about half of that by reducing the sun, then you look at this, and I know it's a complicated figure, but it's actually quite important. This is work by Dave Keith and, and Pete Irvine that was published. Here is a temperature anomaly, and what you see is you look at not the global Earth, but you actually look at individual spots, and you either weight, weighted by land area or by population. And what you can see is that obviously it's warmer if you just have double CO2, and if you reduce that energy imbalance by 50% with geoengineering, it's cooler, that makes sense, that, that's halfway down. It should be roughly half of this. You can also see that the spread, like how far different areas deviate from this, also becomes significantly smaller. So it's not just the average that is better, but actually also the standard deviation of that becomes smaller. If you look at the difference between precipitation and evaporation, that kind of has to do with hydrological cycle water resources, you can actually see that the main difference, again, is that both of them don't change that much. It, gets, it does get, if you saw, wetter under a um, double CO2 scenario because it's warmer, there's more water in the air. But you can see that the spread becomes less. That means from where you are, say right now, to the end of the century has less change for lots of areas. And the same is true for extreme events. Extreme events also in this model look much, much better. So one of the issues we have is that models actually tell you, you know, this doesn't look so bad, right? But this is just looking at outcomes and from a you know, very high altitude. There are things we know that are problematic. This, people who use this quite often as a, a the Mount Pinatubo eruption put about 10 megatons of sulfur into the stratosphere, just to give you a scale of the amount of material we're talking about that's getting into the stratosphere. And what you see is, this happened in, in mid-1991, roughly here, and then you can see that a few years, for one to two years after that, tropospheric temperatures actually were sort of roughly half a degree lower. This is these different traces of observations and model work by uh, Soden that was published in Science. So obviously, in reality, it also works. Volcanic eruptions show this. You do see that it gets drier over here. That gets us back to this figure over here. There's less precipitation, but there's also less evaporation because because it's cool. So what that exactly means depends where you are. And this is one of the challenges. The idea that you can affect the hydrological cycle is um, a very problematic one for these methods. The other thing we know, something very dear to Jim's heart because he spent a lot of uh, very good work on this, has to do with stratospheric ozone. Stratospheric ozone protects us from UV radiation. The world has done a lot. A lot of it with Jim's contribution to actually try, and this is actually a lot of why Jim uh, this contributed to the Dreyfus Award for Jim, is what you see here is from January through March, we want, you see um, the total amount of ozone, and you can see the green is the pre pinatubo average, and the blue are the sort of averages from 1979 to 90, the, the sort of variation. 
And you can see in the year, years after Man Pinatubo, there were significantly less hours in the stratosphere. And we know why this is. Again, a lot because of Jim's work. This has to do with the specific surfaces of this concentrated sulfuric acid that forms from the sulfur injected into the stratosphere. You have reactions that take inactive forms of chlorine shown here into the forms that in the end are also destroying these blue uh, chlorine molecules here. And there's other reactions that occur. It's this very, who was this this morning saying that these surfaces are incredibly complicated? It's very delicate surface chemistry that I think was not entirely obvious beforehand. And those reactions drive the ozone destruction. So if you actually want to get radiative forcing, and let's put about the minus two watts per square meter is, is perhaps half of what you get from double CO2. So what you get is you lose ozone. So you have this trade-off between destroying ozone. This is work by David Keith and myself that we published, uh, where you get decreasing ozone the more you want to cool down the planet. And that is a problem. So the other big problem, I think the bigger problem actually is that you also increase stratospheric temperatures. What you see here is an old plot from 1979 to 2000, stratospheric temperatures going down. That's because of CO2 in the stratosphere going up. And you can see two volcanic eruptions that put sulfuric acid in the stratosphere and you get big excursions where the stratosphere warms up. You may say, what do I care about stratospheric temperature? We live down here. It doesn't really matter and it's been cooling down. But you have a complex coupled earth system with lots of fluids that are going around. And the same way if you put a put off stove on the water and you turn up the heat, you see how the circulation changes. If you change stratospheric temperature, you change stratospheric circulation. And that's not decoupled. That couples to tropospheric circulation and in the end actually to ocean circulation. So now you're starting to turn a knob in a highly complex coupled system. So what can one do? I just want to check the time. Good. Um, so what can you actually do? Well, as chemists, we know exactly why these things happen. Why are we destroying ozone? It has to do with the so the fact that we have sulfuric acid and water and it has to do with the kind of surface that you have that drives these reactions that converts the unreactive carbon to the reactive, sorry, unreactive chlorine to the reactive chlorine. We also know why the stratospheric temperatures increase. That has to do with the absorption features that sulfuric acid has. In particular, it absorbs in a terrestrial infrared reason, right? That's, it absorbs energy. This is why this happens. The stratospheric heating results from an aerosol bulk property, and the ozone destruction comes from an aerosol surface property. And one thing I'll say that has been a painful yet obvious lesson to me is that I think we can find materials where we have high confidence in their bulk properties, meaning there are materials we can find, I'll show you, that should not result in stratospheric heating and not result in circulation changes because of that. These surfaces are profoundly challenging because how do you know that a surface, I'll show this to you, that you study in the lab, how can you be sure? Right, the surface is a surface. It's, there can be another molecule on there and suddenly it's a different surface. So how do you know that a, a, a surface you study in a lab is the same as that surface will be in the stratosphere? And I actually don't have a very good answer for that yet. Um, that's challenging. But the idea, the idea is to look for materials that are non-absorbing and have unreactive surfaces. So let's look about that temperature, the bulk property effect, that in many ways, I, I sort of think it's the more important one, the strata, messing with stratospheric circulation is, is a very high risk uh, thing to do, I would say. And to do that, we need to have materials that don't absorb in the UV solar. In essence, you can sort of think of it, they have to look transparent, largely, right? And they need to have IR properties where what you see here is the infrared spectrum in the terrestrial infrared range, and you can see different black body curves here, 220K, 260K, 290K, and wherever you can see that the actual spectrum seen from space is a 290K, that means radiation is coming through from the surface. It's not being absorbed in the atmosphere. You can see where CO2 is, you have 220K, that's radiation escaping from the stratosphere to space, not from down here. And so whenever you add something that ab absorbs in this, these terrestrial infrared windows, they will heat things up. Right, that's the idea. So what do we want to use? I can tell you the probably best material to consider is diamond, and you may think that sounds insane. Again, what, and somebody's nodding their head that this sounds insane probably. Um, I look at this at this point just as an engineering problem. If you have to manufacture a million tons of 200 nanometer diamonds 
I bet you could do that. And this method intrinsically is already so cheap that it's actually a bad thing that it's cheap. So right now, I'm not considering the cost, and I think one could do this. Diamond really only has absorption features higher than 1600 wave numbers. So it really should have zero stratospheric heating effect outside of a small one I'm not gonna go into. Alumina, aluminum oxide, has a feature around 1,000 wave numbers. So that will result in a little bit of heating probably, right? But it's also a pretty good, uh, has a sharp band here. It's a pretty good candidate, has a weak feature. And calcium carbonate, calcite, has, here's a spectrum overlay and has one little sharp feature right in this atmospheric window. The other ones are pretty much where there's no light coming out. So these are candidates. You can take the optical properties. You can actually see what it will do. And here are what my, my um, collaborators, Sandra and Rahel from ETH Zurich, they've been doing this. This is a comparison of the stratospheric heating you get from injecting 5 million tons every year into the stratosphere at 20 kilometers, um, what you get. So in the top, you see what you get from SO2. This is sort of your volcanic eruption, uh, SO2 gas being injected, cooling effect of about one watt per square meter. And you can see there are significant temperature increases. Um, let, please don't look at the poles. We're, we're not done with the model run yet. The, the poles aren't equilibrated yet, so there's chaos there. But if you look anywhere else ex except for the poles, those are the, um, the, the reliable results. You can see, see, see significant heating. This is about 20 kilometers here that you have. You can see you can also inject it already sort of as sulfuric acid aerosol. So you don't inject SO2. You actually inject a sulfuric acid droplet. And because it's the same compound, you actually see a similar amount of heating uh, in that area and a, a slightly larger degree of cooling because you have a bit, uh, uh, the particles don't get as big. If you look at alumina, you can actually see the heating is significantly less. It's becoming very low. It's like in the point, point 0.1 to point, uh, about point 0.4 range Kelvin here. You do get less, you do get less cooling from it as well though from the five megatons, and that is because these are bigger part particles. 240 nanometers are bigger than the particles you get here. They don't live as long, so the actual amount that's there is less. And calcium carbonate has even less heating. It's starting to be quite insignificant, and we haven't done diamond yet, but I, from the optical properties, it's clear with diamond, you really will get to virtually no uh, stratospheric heating. So I think this gives Good confidence that one can find materials that do this. You can also look at different particle cycles. Here you go from 80 nanometer calcium carbonate to 320 nanometer calcium carbonate. You can sort of see that depending on the particle size, you get different degrees of cooling. That's because of a lifetime and the scattering efficiency you get. There's sort of a trade-off in there. And what you see is you can still get away with pretty low stratospheric heating if you use these alternate materials. So I would argue for that first big problem that I've talked about. And one thing I want to make clear is I'm only looking at the, full, at the first order perturbations, what's happening in the stratosphere. Obviously, you have to also think about what happens when it gets into the troposphere, when it gets on the ground and so on. But I, that we, we haven't done that much research on that yet, and we also, I also don't have the time to talk about this yet. So the stratospheric heating within my, I, I'm more worried about than the ozone in some sense because it's a highly complex system. I think we can actually have a pretty good degree of confidence on. Now we get to the chemistry and this has to do with these surfaces and this where, is where life gets a little bit more difficult. So when I started out thinking about this, I started thinking of alumina. So the first thing that can happen is you start out with alumina. In the stratosphere, there's background sulfuric acid. It'll start getting coated with that, right? So you start going from alumina to something like this or perhaps something where it forms a lens that depends on, on, on contact angle and, and how uh, easily these two coalesce with each other. I also wanted, you know, the alumina is gonna stay in concentrated sulfuric acid, 60, 70% sulfuric acid for a year or two. And I was initially worried you may be leaching out some alumina ions out of this, which is a great fields craft catalyst and that could activate things, but results now have shown that it is really it, uh, factor, it really doesn't react a whole lot. Then you need to think about surface chemical reactions. These have been determined for sulfuric acid. These two up ones, for example. Molina actually did measurements of HCl plus chlorine nitrate, a very important one that makes CL2, because at the time people were interested in what rocket fueled motors with aluminum would do uh, for this. So you can use these results for that, and I'll show you that in a second, what we get from that. So this is what you get. This is what happens to the global ozone column 
if you look at different sizes of alumina and you compare it to SO2 and sulfuric acid. So the SO2 injection, and oh, by the way, this is change in percent, and this is latitude going from the South Pole to the North Pole. What you start to see here is that if you use SO2 or sulfuric acid, you actually are getting significant ozone loss at the poles. You know, 15% is starting to be uh, hefty. Even at middle attitudes and closer to the equator, you're around 5% with this, which is, you know, we've had this before, so it's not something that hasn't been experienced, but there are significant ozone losses that you get. And then you can see that depending on which particle size you use, when you go from 80 nanometers, so if you inject five megatons with 80 nanometers, your surface, you have a lot more surface area, right? Because the surface to volume ratio for these small particles is really high. And if you go to 320, it's lower. And so you can actually see that these bigger particles have much lower ozone loss than uh, the, the smaller particles. One problem with this whole analysis, and I just want to check how much time I have left. <clears throat> when does it end? 10 after? Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm nearly done. Yeah. So one of the problems is you actually look at the data. You go back to literature and don't just take the uptake coefficient that people have reported, but actually look at the data. What you see here is the uptake coefficient for chlorine nitrate. So that's that reaction probability for this reaction that in the end destroys ozone to happen. When Molina did these measurements, here is the amount of HCl, the mixing ratio. They measured from 10 to about 40 to 35 parts per billion, which was what they were interested in for rocket fuel motors because there's HCl coming out of those as well. Where we actually want to be in the stratosphere is down here. So the only data point we know here is you know, the intercept, the zero, zero. That's, that's a fact. And it's not a measurement, but it's true, because it has to be true. So there's a data point here, and there's data points here. And depending on how you fit this data, and if you actually go look at different papers, you can get very different results. So we actually have a profound lack of measurements over here. And here is what I call a realistic fit. Here, so we take actual physical chemistry models of these kind of uptake reactions, and we can fit them to a best fit or realistic fit. Now, what's a realistic fit? Realistic fit is where we, some of the parameters in the best fit start, become, there's a lot of parameters in there. Some of them just become unreasonable. They can't be right. And so if we sort of constrain them, we get to this fit. And if we use that fit, uh, these different fits, so realistic fit, best fit down here is a fit where some physical chemistry colleagues of mine said, well, in the stratosphere, there's a lot of HNO3. That's going to go into the surface there's a lot. It's pretty sticky. That means those surface sites are not available anymore for this reaction to occur. Whether that's true or not is a different question. It's a complicated one. So we have three fits that physical chemists seem are quite reasonable to do, and the differences we get from that, you may, this is now for 240 nanometer uh, aerosol. This is the result that, the blue result is a previous paper that just used sort of the Molina data without really thinking about how, what this fit should look like, right? And when we use these more physical fits, what you can see is, it's not a huge difference, but you can see that the sort of going from the best fit to the HNO3 fit, changes from you know, 2 to 4% ozone loss to marginal ozone loss. The main point is of this is there's a lot of uncertainty, right? We don't quite know what reactions to actually use for this. We also studied calcium carbonate because I initially thought this was a great idea, partly because when calcium carbonate comes back down to the surface, it'll just dissolve away, right? Whereas if you put in a million tons of diamond into the stratosphere and it all comes back down, it's going to stay particles when it comes back back down to the surface. It's so, part of the attraction of diamond is it's so unreactive in the stratosphere, but that also means it's persistent when it comes to ground level, and that's always something to be wary of. Calcium carbonate should dissolve. It's common in the environment. The amount of calcium carbonate that will come back down is nothing compared to the amount of calcite limestone wind-blown mineral dust you have. So in a sense, at least where we live down here, you're not adding something entirely new and different to the system, probably. Um, <clears throat> it has these near ideal optical properties. It doesn't heat up the stratosphere. It actually should neutralize, you know, these acidic surfaces that drive the ozone destroying chemistry. It should actually neutralize those because calcium carbonate will react with acids and hence should perhaps not destroy ozone. So, this is, however, one of the things 
to consider calcium carbonate. We have HCl in the stratosphere, we have HNO3 in the stratosphere, we have sulfuric acid in the stratosphere. So what you're doing when you're neutralizing these acids is you're making all these highly complex salts, and I can guarantee you that these salts do not have the same ozone-destroying chemistry as sulfuric acid. But if you ask me what they do, I don't know. I can tell you what they don't do. They won't do the same thing, but they will do something. So we did some lab experiments, Molina-type experiments, really, um, you know, uptake experiments where you have, we have calcium carbonate inside of this. These were grad students, Jen Dai and, and Colleen. Um, we, we inject HCl into this, and we can sort of either have the HCl beyond the area of calcium carbonate, then we just measure the amount of HCl, and when we pull it back, the HCl will react with the calcium carbonate, and we'll see how much that goes down. We can get to a reactive uptake coefficient. So this work that we did on the top here gave uptake coefficients for the fresh calcium carbonate. So the one that has not been exposed for H to HCl for a long time. In the stratosphere, it'll be exposed to HCl for one to two years. And we got an uptake coefficient of seven times 10 to the minus five. That's pretty low. The stratosphere is extremely dry. There's no water in there. And we thought that explained this. <clears throat> Faye McNeil's group at Columbia did a study where they also looked at fresh calcium carbonate. In fact, they bought the calcium carbonate from the same vendor that we bought, all right? Same calcium carbonate. They got an you know, uptake coefficient. You know, it also starts with a seven, so that's comforting. And just ignore the three orders of magnitude difference in the uptake coefficient. So this is truly remarkable, right? We have two experiments done in very, not exactly the same way, same material, similar way, three orders of magnitude. This shows you how these are difficult experiments and how delicate that system is. We also did experiments where we actually exposed it for uh, many weeks to HCl. At that point, the uptake coefficient that we could measure went, it went so low that essentially you can't measure it anymore. What do you see is this result in two very different kinds of views. One says if that fresh one continues the whole time in the stratosphere, if, right, it'll start eating up the whole calcium carbonate, if ours are correct, you'll get a crust of stuff on the outside and that's the end of the, and it really won't react very far. We don't know what the right answer is. We're trying to redo the experiment in a different way. The comparison uh, is that if we now compare the amount of ozone change as a function of latitude of SO2 and sulfuric acid, again, in this run, the poles are a little questionable. It's not fully equilibrated yet. You can fundamentally see, actually get even to a slight increase in ozone. And I want to make clear that Increasing ozone is not necessarily a good thing. This is not what you necessarily want. So I'll get to my summary. I think you know, this, this research is very controversial for very good reasons. It doesn't fix climate change, right? It's only this painkiller. However, if politicians and the public at some point really want to take action quickly, there's very little you can do. You can go after methane that has a 10-year decadal lifetime, perhaps. You can actually try going after black carbon that only has a few days, but there's very few options to do anything fast outside of this. So I think knowledge is better than ignorance to evaluate risks. I think our study shows high degree of uncertainty with a number of as aspects. There clearly are materials that will lower the risk. Details are very important, and they, I think they are very large uncertainties with respect to the heterogeneous chemistry that's really important for ozone. Uh, one of the fundamental questions is, how do we know that there's calcium carbonate surface that we're looking at a lab? How, how do you know that when you put this in the stratosphere, that surface doesn't actually get coated with something else that changes its chemistry, right? I, I don't know what it would be, but there could be something that does that. And that is one of the big things to really be careful about when one talks about this. And with that, I'll stop. And I hope I didn't go too long. Oh. <laughs>